As far as prayer requests, uh, I've got a few names here, people that need to be uh, being prayed for this week. Uh, we want to remember the Duncan family. Uh, Donna, Bill, and Darlene, all three of them have been battling the COVID. And so Peggy's been taking the mail out, dropping it on the porch, and, and making a quick getaway. But uh, she talked to Darlene on the phone, and I think they're, they're doing okay. Uh, they've had a less severe case than, than some of that's going around. So uh, let's continue to pray for the Duncans. Uh, Dave Allen, um, still uh, getting good reports about his cancer, but we need to keep lifting Dave up in, in our prayers. And same way with uh, Sister Lori Caffrey. Let's continue to pray for her. Um, uh, Brian Douglas, uh, uh, Jerry's son-in-law, we still need to be praying for him. And I think uh, Harriet's going to give us an update here in a few minutes on, on that situation. I want to remind you that um, Daniel Myers will be here tonight to share the word with us. So I encourage you to come back tonight and uh, be a part of that service. And then uh, next Sunday, God willing, we're going to have communion figured out a way of doing that safely, and so uh, we're going to uh, have communion next week. It'll be no contact communion, so you can come and partake of that without fear of being contaminated, so we're going to encourage you to come next week. And it's been a long time since we've served communion uh, here in the church. Uh, I did with my family out on the, out on the deck this summer. Uh, got them all together. We had communion, and and it was, it was special, but it's even more special when you can do it with your church family. And so I encourage you to come next week and be a part of that. Uh, are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Uh, Harriet, do you want to give us an update? Do you want to come up here and do that? Or? I've got a big voice. <laughs> um, I saw Nancy... Uh, Friday, and then uh, Randy called me this morning too to say that um, all our prayers were answered about finding proper transportation for Brian up to the uh, rehab center in Chicago. Um, they left uh, Pittsfield, and a state, maybe you don't know, I didn't know. Brian is a state policeman, and so when they left Pittsfield, the, st the state police car was there and escorted him as far as the next district and every district of police had a police car waiting to escort him and they escorted him all the way to the hospital uh, in Chicago and uh, Nancy said they drove fast <laughs> but he'll be there six weeks to unknown number of months because of uh, He's not able to walk right now, and so they're going to try to get him to do that. It'll be a hard, uh, rigorous rigmarole that he goes through every day because they're going to work him hard trying to get those muscles to work again and relearn what they're supposed to do. And um, if they can't get him so that he can do a certain task or skill, why well, they'll help him learn... Uh, measures that so that he can do things with help, adaptive measures. So um, I asked Jerry to be sure and get their address up there <clears throat> so that you might want to send them some cards. Melissa will be able to stay in the room with him and so um, she'll need money for food and things like that too. So anyway, that's what I know about them. Thank you for sharing that with us, Harriet. And when it comes to that type of therapy, it truly is their model, no pain, no gain. They're certainly going to, you're going to feel some pain while they're getting those muscles back to where they should be. Uh, and uh, what a blessing that was that the state police escorted you from county to county. In my case, that'd be a nightmare if I knew the state police were waiting for me in the next county. But in this case, uh, it truly was a blessing from God that uh, they were there. Um, seems like there was something else I was supposed to announce, but I turned I had a birthday yesterday. I turned sixty. I turned sixty-nine yesterday, and so my memory doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got something, sis? John Lyndon passed away. I don't know. He's uh, prepared taxes for many many years, um, and so just pray for the Lyndon family. Yeah. You know, my dad farms the farm and stuff, so. Just 
Thank you for, for sharing that with us. We'll be sure and uplift that family this week. Well, if there are no other announcements, if you would uh, join me in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with our songs. Really. Dear precious Heavenly Father, Father, we are so grateful and we're humble, Father, to be able to come to your house today. Uh, Father, in this season of uh, celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in many years past, it seems like uh, Jesus has got pushed more and more out of the, the holiday season, but uh, even so much more this year, Father, with the COVID going on, all the political upheaval, and, and Father, it just seems like uh, the focus has not been where it should be, and that's on Jesus Christ, uh, who sacrificed his life for us on Calvary's cross. Father, make it real to us. Uh, help us to realize that this season truly is about Jesus. And Father, we just thank you for Kevin's willingness to come today and to share with us and to look into your word. And, and Father, make it come alive to us. Help us to uh, not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, Father. Uh, give us what it is that you've prepared for us through him. And then help us to take that in our, our hearts and our lives this week and, and put it into practice. Father, these prayer requests that have been mentioned here today lift each and every one up to you. Father, you know what the needs are, even above and beyond what we know. And so, Father, we just commit these things into your hands. We truly love you, and Father, we're here to serve you. And Father, we just pray that everything that we say and everything that we do here today will in some way bring glory and honor to your holy name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, we'll have our hymns. First hymn is 271. Joyful, joyful, we adore you.
next we'll do, it came upon a midnight clear, we'll do verses 1, 2, and
thought that I was trying to make him ride it down backwards. So he said, no, I want your seat. And I was like, okay, you can have my seat. <laughs> so I got in the other seat. He ran that thing. And man, he, I don't think he ever ran another water slide after that. He did not, yeah, he did not feel well. His stomach was messed up. It was very funny. So, <laughs> so, but I didn't try to do strategy that one time. And, and one of the things we're going to see God's strategy for salvation and it, how it worked against Satan and how Satan was trying to do one thing and God was bringing about a whole other thing. Uh, so let's read Hebrews 2, 10 through 18. For in the bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source of their salvation perfect through their suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death, he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffered, when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning. Yeah, we do. It's just amazing just to be in your presence, God. It's just amazing. I was singing about your son's birth, God. It's amazing just to be in this season where we're celebrating, God. When so much unknown is happening this year, God, you were faithful. You provided. And we are thankful to be here right now. We are thankful for you. We are thankful for your son. We are thankful for Bethlehem, the, the child was born, God. And we are thankful for Jerusalem, where your son was killed on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. God, I pray that over this next few minutes, God, that our ears will be open. That our hearts be opened. God, that life change would happen through your word, through your spirit, God. Lord, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. So starting with this passage, you quickly see, and I'm going to apologize again, I do move around. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like I'm sitting there like, oh man, they're going to get me. <laughs> But starting in this passage, one of the first things we see, and it's one of those things that we don't think about, okay? None of us like suffering. If I said, who wants to go suffer? No one's raising their hands. No one's up. I mean, you would have, well, yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, you always have one kid that goes, yeah. It's like, every church you're in, no matter what the question is, it's like, I'm like, no, you would not. Like, suffering is not an exciting thing. Suffering is something that happens and whenever we talk about suffering, we talk about it in this way. We talk about it in this way. We say, we'll get through it. God will provide. We don't go. This is the best day of my life. We literally are talking in ways that Jesus will help us. God will provide. God will get us through it. And the thing is, whenever we look here, Jesus was the forebearer of suffering. He went through it first. He paved the way for our sufferings because sufferings are going to happen. Sufferings are exhausting. Sufferings are very frustrating to go through and none of us sign up for it. But yet God promises they're coming. God tells us. He's not sitting there trying to pull the rug out from under us one day. He literally tells us when we come to Christ, sufferings will happen. Okay, I've been to a few mission trips in Romania, and one of the guys that I read about in Romania, because they had a communist persecution over there at the church, uh, this pastor was named Richard Wormbrand. Okay, it's a weird name, I know. It kind of sounds like an evil character, but he's not. He's awesome. Like, when I hear Wormbrand, I'm like, what? 
Who was he off of? Okay? Uh, but the thing is, this guy was a godly man. He was one of the only ones to stand up in a whole congregation of pastors to the communist regime. Okay? He spent years in prison. He was beaten, tortured for Jesus. And he tells one story about this other pastor who was in prison with him. And they, they got him in prison. And then they brought his son in there. And they had this guy chained up. And his son comes in. Of course, you don't know what's about to happen. Because these people are sadistic and demonic. And they look at him and they say, look, if you don't work in a cross, we're going to beat your son to death in front of you. You're like, whoa. How could I do that? And the son, the son looks at his dad and says, I would rather die in this jail than be the son of a coward. Guys, our sufferings here bear nothing compared to what others go through. Our frustrations with government here bear no resemblance to other things people have gone through. And Jesus paved the way for the suffering of the cross. So whatever we go through in sufferings, Jesus paid much more than we will ever pay. Even if it's our lives. Because there was this thing that happened on the cross where there was, there was a judgment of sin. Okay? We all think about the cross being, okay, the cross was painful. But can you imagine the sinless one having the sins of the world placed on him and the excruciating pain that would cause? Knowing no sin and then all sin placed on him. Okay? That's what happened. And so the thing is, when we are going through sufferings, we can look to Christ, and it's that time where we can go, Jesus will provide, Christ will provide. It's those things, it's that cross that keeps us looking forward rather than going, I don't know if I can make it through this. I don't know if I can do it. I know one time, I was on another mission trip. Now, I like to hike, okay? If we go to mission trips, normally it's going to be mountains or hiking. And this is one of the coolest things. This, me and this guy were hiking, and we get to the top of this peak. Now, it's not very high. I don't want to make it sound amazing. It was just 8,000 feet. It was a three-hour hike. It was a long hike, but it was just 8,000 feet. But we're sitting there above the timber line where there's no trees, okay? So you can see everywhere. And we're sitting there talking. He's like, man, it's fun getting up here, but it's amazing whenever you look down and you see all the growth in the valley. of sermons. Guys, how many of us grow towards Christ, grow towards more godly character when we are in those valleys of suffering? You don't see a lot of growth on the mountaintops, but man, you see a lot in the valley because you're having to depend on Him all the time. You're not forgetting about Him one day. You're sitting there focused on Him. And so the thing is, whenever we see this past, we see that suffering that Christ went through, that he paved the way. And then also, he brings something else up in verse 12. He starts calling us children of God. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to the congregation. Again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. Guys, we are children of God. Now, the funny thing about being a child, okay, Whenever I go home to Texas this week and bring all my family with me, and we're going to have a blast, we have family rights in our house, right? Like whenever your kids or grandkids are in the house, they have family rights, okay? <laughs> we do have 24 cousins. That's a lot. So, <laughs> but the thing is, there are a, there is a there is a family dynamic. There are family things that you can do. Now, when I go home. I don't have to do anything. Like, it's not a, a, rep, a thing where I'm going to go, okay, I've got to do the dishes at night. But there's not a thing where I go, oh, I've got to clean the bathroom, vacuum the floors. I will do some of those things to help out, but it is not a thing where they go, man, well, you're checking in with us today. Okay, did you do the dishes? Uh, did you vacuum the room you're sleeping in? Did you do this? There's nothing there. There is a family right that we have as children of God that lets us come before the Father, that lets us pray to Him, that lets us stand before the throne, that will eventually give us an inheritance in heaven. That is exciting. The suffering brought about the family right. 
The suffering brought about our right standing in Christ. It gave us the privilege of being children. That's our identity. When I look at the world, I see how the world's going with identity issues everywhere. The only identity we have that we have to stand for is being children of God. That's it. If we get that right, all of our other labels are going to fall into place. Whether it's dad, mom, grandma, grandpa, they all fall into place if we are living as children of God. The next part of this kind of it's kind of a fun thing that I see with the strategy. So, so Satan obviously wanted Jesus to suffer. Um, it didn't work out for him like he thought it would. Uh, he obviously wanted him to die. He obviously did not want us to be children of God. But if you look at verse 15 and 14, it says, Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death he might destroy the one. Holding the power of death, that is the devil. And I always think this is kind of funny because I can almost see like Satan rejoicing when Jesus has died. It's like, yeah, I won. And then it's like, oh crap. <laughs> oh, this is not good. This was what God wanted. He wanted his son to die. He wanted the sins of the world placed on him. He, but, but I want my path now. And Jesus disturbs it. Like, Satan has no power over us. I want, I want you to understand this. Like, so many times as even Christians, we can get this mindset with temptation and things like that, that we go, oh, well, Satan made me do that, or Satan makes me act this way. It's not Satan. It's our flesh that makes us act a certain way. And by sitting there saying Satan's making you do things, you are giving him a power he has no power over you. You are saying, oh, well, Satan made me everywhere at all times. Man, that sounds a lot like Jesus. It sounds a lot like that. Satan has no power. Satan has no power over you. So we can't sit there and go, well, Satan made me do stuff. He doesn't make you do anything. Your flesh makes you sin. Your flesh is still there. There will be a day where sanctification happens. But until that day, Satan doesn't have power over you. Like, can you, can you just think about that? There is no power. That sun coming for Christmas, okay? That son that was born in a manger came to strip the power of Satan from us. He came to take it away. He came to strip the power of death. So then we look at the rest of this, the rest of this passage, starting in verse 16. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God, to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. It's amazing to me that our Savior knows what we go through. Like, it's not as if, like, I know whenever I go to ask advice from people, I want people that have been in the situation I've been in before. I don't want, unless it's some weird situation where I just kind of want an outsider to view, most of the time you want empathy. You want somebody who's walked in before. You want somebody who has been in that battle, who has come through it, who you can go, man, they probably have some godly wisdom they gained from this. You don't want somebody that's, I have no clue what you're going through, I'm sorry. That's not an exciting thing whenever you're going through a trial or temptation or anything like that. That's not something you go, man, that's exciting. The guy has no clue what I'm talking about, but man, he said he was praying for me. Like, we, we don't, we don't, like, sometimes we use that, I'll pray for you as a, hey, I'll think about it. <laughs> you know? But the thing is, it's like, Jesus went through temptation too. He knows what it feels like. So we can't sit there and go, man, Jesus doesn't understand me. <laughs> He understands everything. Like, I think it's funny whenever we try to put our sufferings, like, I mean, our sufferings could be like, I mean, it took McDonald's a few extra minutes this morning to get my, uh, <laughs> my sausage and biscuit with cheese, or, the, or the, the biscuit was a little brickish, you know? I got one of the old ones they had in the back, and they're like, okay, here it is. Those are our sufferings that sometimes we get frustrated about, and yet Jesus died on the cross, and we're like, 
Oh, what was me? My, my sausage biscuit wasn't perfect this morning. Jesus is like, I don't want to cross. I think I understand your sufferings. I think I understand this enough. Guys, he is a faithful high priest. He is not someone that doesn't understand us, that doesn't understand what it's like to have flesh. He was 100% flesh, 100% God. And he died on the cross for those sins. And he didn't sit there and not understand anything about us. He knows us intimately. He knows what it's like. Those sins that you have that just keep coming back at you. He understands the temptation. We have a high priest that is empathetic towards us. We have a high priest that understands us. So when we sit there and we look at this scripture and we wrap it up and we go, okay, what do we take from this? Because the thing is, there's one thing about explaining it. We can go, okay, grasp it. How do we put it in our lives at this moment? Because the thing is, I get it. We sometimes look at Scripture and we go, man, that's, that's a great explanation. But we don't take it that next step and go, okay, how am I going to put it in my life? The first thing is sufferings always look forward. I think it's interesting that a lot of times in sufferings, we try to look back. We try to look at things in the past. We try to look at things whenever we felt like things were better. And it's almost saying, Jesus Christ, you died for my sins on the cross. You did all these great things for me. My life was so much better back then. I don't think you can bless me anymore in the future. But yet we have heaven waiting. But yet we're constantly looking backwards. Because in sufferings, you cannot look backwards because this is the thing, one of the things that I learned in my own life, going through stressful things that I've gone through, is number one, God's always going to provide. Number two, he's going to provide more than I'm thinking he's going to provide. Whether that's going to be in any way, he's going to be in that moment. He is going to be pushing you forward. He is going to be growing you, teaching you new things. And that's going to be more of a blessing than you sitting there looking back. Man, I remember when I had that one quiet time that was so amazing for like a week in a row. I wish I could go back there. I felt closer to you. We, we look back at that, not looking forward at the goal ahead. We think that is heaven on earth, those times that we had spiritual growth. And God's sitting there going, I'm growing now. Look at me now. I remember one of the worst times I've ever been there. Okay, and this is a this is a great one. Um, I worked at a church in Fort Worth, Texas, or a little outside of Fort Worth, Texas, and the pastor literally had me fired within three weeks. For this was literally, I promise you, no reason of my own. He just didn't like us all of a sudden, and he was mad at Lindsay. He brought her into a meeting and got us both yelled at by a parent. It was wild. It was one of those things that we didn't know what was coming. It was just like, what just happened? And so we during that time we were we had suffered a miscarriage during those three weeks. And then we found out that we were praying with ace, okay? So now you have to understand, we found out we were praying with ace when I had no job. Okay? And so I start looking for a job. Okay, now, there are these things in seminary called job boards, and you can normally find one. So I started printing bulletins at a church okay, for about $10 an hour. And there was this other job that uh, I applied for. It was a, a caretaker, but it didn't really give any details of what I was going to be doing. Okay? So I, I got to this job the first day. And uh, let's just say it, it got awkward because he, he needed my help in, in the restroom area. Uh, and I, I'm not a nurse, I'm not, I was not, yeah, and that was not in the job description. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, wow, this is pretty bad. <laughs> I don't know if I could have gotten a worse job today. But the whole time God grew me during that, even though I honestly, God, is like, you don't know, if you, if you have done it, praise God you did it, but if you haven't, don't. <laughs> it's rough to be that subservient sometimes. But the whole time God was working on my pride. And 
I knew that. And I was like, God, thank you for working on this. Even though I'm not enjoying it, even though it's not like, oh man, I get to go to work today. You're making me suffer through something I need to suffer through. And I saw so much growth during that period of time. But when I go through sufferings now, I don't look back and go, man, I wish I could go back to this. I look back and go, God, you provided then, you'll provide now. You'll always provide. And maybe provisions aren't exactly like what we want. Maybe the provisions are something different. But he is a God who provides the sufferings. And we need to look forward to what he's going to provide. Not looking back at what all of a sudden, I wish I could go back to these days. Because God, you've gotten better for me. Because the thing is, our goal that we're striving for is not on this earth. Our goal we're striving for is seeing him being in his presence, being told, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what our suffering is for us. The next thing I want you to think about is just living in your identity as a child of God. Living in that identity. You have family rights. You have the right to go before him daily. Guys, think about the cosmic creator, the one who created everything that we have, everything that we see, allows you to talk to him in a personal tone. How many of you have talked to the President of the United States before? Nobody? Okay, I'm going to tell you a story. I don't, he wasn't president. I talked to George W. Bush one time. But he wasn't president. He was governor of Texas at the time. So technically, I mean, you kind of been in the line, right? Just a little bit? No. Uh, he was governor. But the thing is, I don't have his phone number. He didn't give it to me as a five-year-old when he talked to me. Okay? That wasn't like this good friendship all of a sudden. But the thing is, Jesus, God, sits there and gives us the right to come before him daily. I think sometimes we'd be more starstruck talking to the president than we'd be talking to the cosmic creator who created everything we see. Guys, those family rides are huge. Don't forget them. Don't forget that you have them. Don't forget that you can come before him daily. Do it daily. Do it whenever you just think about it. It's like, I think I've told you before, one of the favorite things I used to get on Facebook and on Sunday morning, just kind of scroll through and see what's going on. And now I was like, man, I need to start praying for all the pastors. And I have a lot of pastors on my feed. I was like, why am I just praying for them? So I just started doing that. That's an easy way to do it. It's like I have a prayer journal I got to do during the week. Don't leave out those family rides. Always keep them. And lastly, Jesus going through things. Going through temptation. Give us that hope to make it through. Whether it's temptation or what. Whether it's sufferings or whatnot. We have a Savior who understands. We have a Savior who loves. We have a Savior who cares. He's not some being that just sits on a cloud and throws lightning bolts at us when we sin. He knows where we've been. He knows what it feels like. He knows what the flesh pulling against you feels like. Trust Him and love Him. Live as a child. Live as a child of the King. And don't look back in struggles. Always know that He is sitting there. That He loves you. That He cares for you. So we're going to pray real quick. And I want you to think of a few things as we pray. Do you live as a child of God? Are you going through trials? Are you struggling right now? And are you remembering Christ through all of this? Are you remembering who He is? Are you saying, hey, Jesus, you are everything to me and I want you only? Are you going through a trial where you just want health? Where you just want normal feelings? Where you just want to feel like you used to? Because God provides more than you can ever imagine. But sometimes we're, we're okay with selling for the crumbs off the table. 
So Jesus, we come before you this morning, thankful for your word, thankful for just being your children, God. Having family rights to you. That's amazing that we call the creator of the universe, Father. God, I pray for any that are going through trials and are struggling right now, God, that they would be looking forward, that they would be pressing towards you, that they would be knowing that you are the great provider, you are the provision. Help us not look back. Help us not dream of a time that we think things are better because you're in our presence. You are greater than any time in our life, than anything that we've ever done. You're all we need, God. As we leave this place, God, we are thankful to celebrate that child, your son, born in a manger. And we're thankful to celebrate the king that will come again, that will judge that will bring his children to glory. We pray all these things in your name, God. Amen. Let's sing Joy to the World, uh, first and last verse. And remember the joy that Christ has given to us while singing.